Father, we thank you for this, this morning, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've prepared for each one of us. Most importantly, Lord, I'm grateful, Lord, that you've given me your righteousness and taken all my sin away, Lord, that you exchanged, Lord, um, your life for mine, Lord. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that by the end of the day, I would leave here loving you more than when I came in, Lord. We're thankful that you, you drew each man here to your side. I pray that everyone in this room knows you. Lord, I pray that today you'd speak to us from the borders of another world. You'd bring the atmosphere of heaven to this very room. And by the power of your spirit, Jesus, you would take the things that belong to you and reveal them unto us. Unless you speak, Lord, we're wasting our time. So, Father God, we pray that your words would be heard and not mine. In your name, amen. Um, let's read. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse or, or, or various trials, multicolored trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace and the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the, man, shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Who was James, the author of this letter? Um, the overwhelming consensus is, is that it's the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's clear that Jesus had brothers and sisters. If you go to Matthew, it says this in Matthew 13, 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this his mother called Mary and his brother and James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Where did Jesus get all this learning from? And in fact, they would even say that Jesus didn't go to their schools. He wasn't taught in their, in their seminaries or their synagogues. Where did he get all these things? We got his brothers. We got his sisters. Now, James is always mentioned first as we go through the list of his brothers and sisters. So they call him James the Elder. He was born right after Jesus. His brother to Jude, Jude wrote a half letter, a little teeny letter. I call it like a half a letter because it's not big, small. Jude, like Jude. We're going to meet Jude. Okay, guys, tracking. Just make it sure. You can be sure that Jesus came from a big family. He came from, I have two older brothers and a younger sister. He came from a big family. He shared a small house in Nazareth with Jesus with his brother. Two sisters, uh, they were not rich. When Jesus was born, they offered a turtle dove. They offered the, the offering of a poor family. So Jesus didn't come from wealth. He didn't come from notoriety. He didn't come from anything that would make anybody think he was anything special. He came from really low down. In fact, he was born in an alleyway to a 16-year-old Jewish girl, they think. 15, 16-year-old Jewish girl. He was born in, those, in, the, in that way, I think, for me, because he's approachable. We can all approach Jesus, that Jesus is available to each one of us. He was willing to come to that alleyway and he was willing to come to my heart and your heart. In James' house, James got to grow up with Jesus. Now, when I think about that, if you really want to find out a lot about me, in fact, if you come to my church and my mom visits, she's from Florida, she runs, single-handedly runs everybody away by telling them all my dirt when I was a kid. They don't come back and listen to me anymore. Um, <laughs> You want to find out about somebody, you, you go talk to their brothers, their sisters. You don't listen to them because they'll tell you the good stuff. You find the real deal. James knew Jesus. I'm really interested in this letter because James knew Jesus intimately, what was important to Jesus. So what was important to Jesus was important to James after James got converted. And as I look at, at, at James, I look at his early life, he didn't believe in Jesus. Just imagine sharing a bunk with Jesus. Imagine that. Imagine just living in a house like that. 
In fact, his brothers try to put him to the test. When Jesus is, is showing himself, doing these miracles, doing these wonderful things, his brothers try to tell him to go to Judea, that, but that's where he could be killed. Let me read John for you because it's an interesting setup. John 7, chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee for he would not walk in Jerusalem. He didn't want to go down to Jerusalem because the Jews sought to kill him. His time hadn't come yet. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, and his brother and said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. Why don't you go down to Judea and put yourself at, you know, put yourself to the test. Go down there and, and poke poke the nose of these religious leaders who want to kill you. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world, for neither did his brethren believe in him. His brethren didn't believe in him, even after they saw the things he was doing and saying. As a matter of fact, Jesus would say, who are my mother? Who is my brother? Who are my sisters? Who are, who is my real family? Who's the real family of Jesus? Those that do the will of the Father, which is in heaven. That's my real family. That's why we can be adopted. We sang a song, we can be adopted into God's family. Aren't you glad you're adopted into God's family? That he loves you and that he gave himself for each one of us and now he calls us brothers. He calls us one of the family. It's an amazing thing. After the resurrection, we see all of his brother and his family, Mary included, in the upper room praying for the Holy Ghost, praying for the gift of the Spirit to fall on them. What is fascinating is that even though they saw the miracles, even though they saw Jesus grow up, even though they saw his holy life, they couldn't get past the fact that this is God, that Jesus is God. And a lot of religions can't get past that fact either. Jesus and God, they are one. They're the same. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And Jesus is approachable to each one of us, approachable to any man with any problem in this room right now. So what turned James? What turned James around? That's what I was wondering. Well, James, he went from testing his brother, trying to get him killed, to believing, to becoming a man of faith. In his very brother, it's the resurrection. Jesus paid him a visit. After Jesus appeared to Peter and the disciples, over 500 witnesses at one time, he takes his brother aside and he has a talk with them, and I would have loved to have heard that, that speech. 1 Corinthians says this, just so you can get the, the background. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Paul speaking, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as one as of one born out of due time. This event had such an impact. The resurrection of Jesus Christ had such an impact on his family and on his brother that James becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He's praying to his own brother to fill him with the Spirit. He's asking his own brother for forgiveness of sins. And he was a righteous man. We know him as James the Just. James had a relationship with Jesus like no other. That's why I'm interested in this epistle. Martin Luther would call this a straw epistle. He says this is weak on the grace, of grace alone through faith alone. He was into Paul's, Pauline theology. I'm into James theology because James is going to get in my face and tell me the kind of man that Jesus wants me to be. He's going to tell me that I need to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. I need to be somebody who's going to be mature, somebody who's going to, going to, going to be filled with the Spirit whenever a trial or temptation or difficulty hits my life. I'm going to realize that God's doing that to grow me for a greater purpose. And it's not just for this earth, it's for eternity. God's building in something, us, in, in, something in each one of us that is much deeper than prosperity or the things that most churches talk about or buildings or sizes of fellowship. He's building in us an eternal reward. This is a momentary light affliction, the Bible says. But he's building in us and he's making us creatures of eternity. Our home is in heaven with the Lord. 
And this event, this resurrection of Jesus Christ, it, blow, it blows me away because Muhammad's gone. These books are written. You've got any, any religion you want to trot out there. They do not have a resurrected Savior. They have a maybe, a hope so. I have a risen hope. I know that my Redeemer lives. As Job would say, I'm going to stand on that day and my eyes are going to behold Jesus. He is the only author and finisher of any faith that can save you. Without him, there is no savior. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no other mediator between God and man. James had a religion. He had a Jewish religion. And when he saw his brother risen from the dead, he says, oh my goodness, this is the very living God I was with. He gives his life over to God through Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins and leads the church in Jerusalem. What an amazing event. Yet he never drops the name that Jesus is my brother. What does he call himself? A servant, a doulos of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his title. I want to be a slave of Jesus. Many people want titles. James just wanted to be a slave. Do I want to be a slave of Jesus? You know, I look at James and I start thinking of myself and I start thinking, man, I need, and he also tells me, not many should want to be teachers or rulers in this epistle because we're going to get the double judgment. We teach these things week after week after week. This should be a reality in my life. He was a deeply spiritual man, James. They called him camel knees because he prayed so much his knees got calloused. Anybody here got camel knees? Mm -mm. Nobody's that holy. I'm not. You know, I should be. I should be on my knees more. I should be on my knees every day. I got two daughters, 16, 12. Should be on my knees all the time. Pray over them every night. You got children. We should be praying. We got fellowships. We got people in this very room that are having difficulties. Prayer. Prayer is our connection. And it's funny to me too. We get saved by how? Praying. Right? We get in the kingdom by asking Christ into our lives. Do we continue that same prayer that we prayed when the day we got saved? That was desperate. I remember being in the parking lot outside of Philly and listening to Joe teach and I just was so broken down. I got in the car and I just cried out to Jesus. And ever since that day, God has moved into my life and changed me in miraculous ways. But I've never lost the wonder of that night. And I keep praying that same way. God keeps, God keeps revealing himself to me. Keep that passion, that desperation, that prayer life. As he writes this letter, he doesn't give us suggestions. He's going to give us commands. There's over... 50 imperatives in this letter. Do it. Don't just talk about it. Do it. That's one thing about Christianity that I think is lacking. We talk a lot. We got great ministers. We got people that can exegete the Bible way better than, than, than any of us in this room. We know. We don't lack for knowing. We lack for doing. He's going to say do. Be a doer. Not just a hearer. Don't just listen. Do it. Yet he's going to show grace to the Gentile church when it comes down to the decision of how Jewish should they be when they come into the church. Great argument in, in the book of Acts. Should we get circumcised? Should we follow Sabbath day? You've got Seventh-day Adventists they are still following Sabbath day. What do we have to do to be saved? James is going to be so gracious. He's going to say, look, we're not going to put nothing on him. He says in Acts 15, he says this about us. And I'm grateful for it. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, the things of this world, and from fornication, fornication in the church, sexual sin, and from things strangled in blood, which means things that would offend other religious, the religious Jews at that time. We shouldn't go out of our way to offend people with our liberty. In fact, our liberty is not licensed. It should be used. It, 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 in fact, put it this way, and I'll give you a good example. Liberty. Drinking. Is drinking wrong? Right? I get people in my fellowship, they always want to come and say, it's not in the Bible. It isn't in the Bible. But for me, it's wrong. Because if I'm going to try to help an alcoholic get off of alcohol, I'm going to do it with them. I'm not going to drink either. I'm waiting for Jesus Christ to come and drink a cup of wine with me in the kingdom. We can forego some of our liberties for the sake of the kingdom. That's maturity. And that's what this letter is all about. Being mature. But he's very gracious to the church. And he just says, look, just give up fornication. Don't, don't use your liberty to offend people. Abstain from idolatry of the world. Now, tradition tells us that he was a Nazarite with long hair. 
a holy man. He wore linen clothing. He was admired by believers and unbelievers alike. James was. They called him, like I said, James the just. He was so righteous. Now, what's incredible that as we go through the letter, we're going to see James teach a lot of the same things his brother taught. He was listening. James was paying attention to his older brother and what he taught. There are numerous examples in this letter. I'm just going to give you two before we jump into the first few verses. James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Matthew 7, Jesus says this, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks, receives. He that seeks, finds, and to him that knocks, it shall be opened. What man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Now, you know why he was camel knees, right? He was on his knees asking for wisdom. Asking for the Spirit of God to fall on him so he could lead this fledgling church through a period of transition into the grace of God that's reached all the way down to our century and us today. James 1 2 says this My brother, and count it all joy when you fall into different various trials or temptations. Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely or in a deceitful fashion for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The most profound effect that Jesus had on his brother was humility. He became a man of prayer on bent knees, never claiming a title, admired by everybody. So much so that he writes in chapter 2, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor man, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts. James, don't be a respecter of persons. You never know who you're, who you're talking to or who you're living with. He lived with God his whole life and didn't even know it. There's a lot of people that go to churches every day. We're around God and we don't really know God. Do you want to know about God or do you want to know God? His brother was God, not just a well-behaved carpenter. When you know Jesus, you know humility, and that's what I see in James' life, a humble man. Now, he's martyred in A.D. 62, and he died like his older brother. According to tradition, he died with dignity. He was brutalized on his way out, um, eight years before the temple was destroyed. His influence was so strong that many of the rulers started believing, which horrified the Pharisees and Sadducees. He was so persuasive in, in his in his presentation of the gospel, the many Pharisees and religious folks were getting saved in Jerusalem. They invited him to speak at the top of the temple. They put him on top of the, the pinnacle of the temple on Passover. He took full advantage and preached Jesus. He was shoved off that pinnacle. He fell, but he didn't die. And he threw him off. He didn't die. He rose to his knees and he prayed just like his brother, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the Pharisees and the leaders rushed in and a man, they stoned him to death, but a man hit him with one blow with a club, and he went to be with his brother. That's how he died. Um, most of the, everyone except for John, of the disciples of Jesus that saw him alive, they died a heinous death, so that you would know today that what you believe in is fact. It's not fiction. We've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the majesty of who Jesus really is. It's not a fable. What we believe in is a reality. Jesus Christ is alive. He's going to come back to this earth. He's going to invade it and take over. And he's going to take his children home. These things are factual. These are biblical. Jesus Christ is alive. And you know what? If he's alive right now and his brother was willing to die for him and get thrown off a cliff, then I want that power in my life to stand for him. 
Christianity is not just an idea or a mantra or some words on a page or something we put up on a wall. There has to be the power of Christ's resurrection in my life so that I'm willing to die for my Savior because death is not, it, that's just the doorway to where I really want to be anyway. That's just, I'm, they're sending me home sooner. As you read, you got to keep in mind the audience, the scattered sheep, the Jewish folks of that day. They were having a difficult transition. They had to leave the temple. They had to leave all their religious. They were moving out of the shadow of the law and into this new thing called grace that the Passover lamb was sacrificed once. We don't need any more lambs or bloods of bulls and goats. We have Jesus. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from everything. And James is bridging that gap. He's trying to bridge that gap from religion into relationship. And it's funny because Calvary Chapel was started on relationship. I had heard the gospel in my whole life until I heard it presented as a relationship. It became a reality in my life. The information was there, but I touched with the spirit of the living God and it became a reality in my life. So coming out of religion is hard. Coming into something, there's a genuine reality. There should be a power in our lives. And, and man, I got to say, there's a lack of power in the church. When we're struggling with the same things that he's going to be talking about here, there's a lack of power. We need Holy Spirit power. We need a revival in all of our lives. The whole theme of his letter is spiritual maturity. As we go through, we start to see why. The Jewish believers were having many problems in the early church, in their personal lives, and in their fellowships that they were creating. They were going through trials and testings. They were tempted to sin. Some were showing favoritism to the rich. If a rich guy comes into church, we want to get him, we want to get him on a roll, we want to treat him good. Let his wife play the violin up front and try to make him happy because he gives a lot of money. If any of you are going to start a fellowship, I got a good plan for you. Don't know who gives what. I don't know who gives what. I don't care. I just know how much we can work with. And then I'm responsible for what God gives us. I don't want to know who gives what. I want to meet everybody because everybody's equal. Does it matter how much money you have or what clothes you're, you're dressed in? James is going to say, no. Stop it. Stop showing favoritism in the church. Others are being robbed by the rich. Church members were competing for offices. I know that doesn't happen in, in today's church, but it happened back then. They were competing particularly for teaching offices. They wanted to be a teacher. They wanted to get on the stage. Not a lot of setup men in the church. There's a lot of people, they could set this event up, but if they don't get to participate in it, they don't want to be a part of it. James, disciples, willing to set things up. Look at David. Remember David? He wanted to build that temple so bad, did he not? Man, he was, he was Lord, I just want to build this temple. I want to do it for your glory. God says, you're not going to build the temple. You're a, man of, you're a man of war. What does he do? He goes out and wars against all the Canaanite tribes, and he takes all that money, and he doesn't take it for himself. He takes it to build it up for his son so his son can be there. Something he's not even going to be a part of. Man, that's sending treasure ahead. Planting something that you might not even be a part of to see it grow later in people's lives. That what you do is going to echo down through eternity. You're going to get gifts for things you didn't, even, you, you didn't even know you were doing. Man, that's a legacy that I want to live. I want to stand in front of God's throne and I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I, that, that's, that, that's, that, that's what really turns me on seeing people saved and I saw it and I still see it in Calvary Chapel and I see it in groups I see it in men they go out and they work jobs and they teach the Bible if God's given them that gift and you see stuff start to grow you see people come to know the Lord you see families healed you see a power in it that's what turns me on the power of God working in people's lives the major problem that they had was failing to live what they professed to believe they weren't doers of the word they listened People were using their tongues. He's going to talk about the tongue. They were using their tongues to divide um, and create wars. Worldliness and sin were rampant. And to my amazement, nothing has changed in, changed in 2,000 years in the church. The same problems that plague most churches to one degree or another. We see people suffer because of disobedience. I was talking to somebody outside earlier. How does the counseling, you know, it must be hard to counsel everybody. I said, I can sit down with somebody and I can know if I can counsel them or not in 10 minutes. What do you mean? I give them the word of God and if they're not willing to obey that, I can't help them anymore because if they're not willing to listen to Jesus, they're not going to listen to my knuckleheadedness. <laughs> right? What, am I going to convince you? If Jesus can't convince you, how am I going to convince you? 
I don't know in 10 or 15 minutes. If you want somebody to talk to, I can sit and listen. But the point is, is, is we need to be mature. We need to grow up. We need to start being a doer of the word. We see Christians talk one way and live another. Know the Bible, yet don't live it. People who can't control their tongues, very hurtful, backbiting, politics in the church. You see all of these problems. All of these problems, according to the Holy Spirit in this letter, have one common cause, and it's spiritual immaturity. It's lack of growth. They couldn't grow up. Now, James is going to use the word perfect many times. The word means to be complete, mature, or balanced. I like balanced. Complete, mature. Spiritual maturity is something that, that I'm trying to work on. Uh, you know, my wife told me the other day, you know, you're a pastor now. You've got to be a better listener. You've got to really have more tact and all these other things. And then I, I berated her for five minutes and told her how wrong she was. You don't know what you're talking about. I proved her point in like two minutes. <laughs> you're out of your mind. I'm very, very kind and I listen to everybody. I, nobody likes looking in the mirror, right? Right? But that's what God's asking us to do. Look in the mirror. James is going to say, take a look in the mirror. Look at your life. I'm convicted. I need to have camel knees. And our churches, as I look at our churches today, they become entertainment centers for spiritual babies. Children. I need help. I need help. I need help. You want to do the word? No, I don't want to do the word. You've got to help me. Can't help you. Jesus can help you. Jesus rose from the dead. He's got power over the grave. He's coming back in power and great glory. I'm sure he can help you if you'll yield. If you'll yield to his spirit. Growing up, not catering and coddling people. Now the problems that James addresses um, all have the, it's, it's the attitude of being childlike, childish. We should have a childlike faith, but we shouldn't be childish. Impatient with difficult circumstances. No control over the tongue. Lack of self-control. Fighting. Coveting. Collecting toys. James 5, he's going to say, go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for the miseries that are come upon you. You're trusting in riches. Anybody watch that show, Preppers? No? It's big up in the Poconos. There's a lot of Preppers up there. You should check it out. <laughs> Everybody's got a bunker and silver and gold and food. Everything's stored up. We're prepping. James is like, go to now, you rich men, weep and howl. The miseries that are coming. What's coming on this world, guns is not going to save us. Only a Holy Spirit revival is going to save us. Those things are going to save us. I'm not saying don't be prepared. What I am saying is Jesus Christ is coming. And when he comes, there's going to be, it's going to be weeping and howling. The age of grace is rapidly shutting down. The opportunity to actually yield your life to Jesus Christ and see him work in your life is rapidly coming to an end. Jesus Christ is going to return. And at that point, we're going to know what we are. How to read the letter for maximum benefit. Well, first off, it's for believers. Anybody here not a believer? Great. Everybody here is born again, filled with the Holy Ghost. Awesome. If it's for a believer, then it's for me. You have to read it for yourself. I need to look in the mirror. As I go through this, I need more of Jesus. I am a baby sometimes as a pastor. I can be a big baby. Man, you throw in a wedding, a funeral, and it all happened this week when I had to come down here and teach. And I was like, yeah. I can be a real baby. Um, I'm just speaking the truth. I want to be more mature. When somebody comes up to me and asks for the hope that lies within me, I want to give them an answer. I don't want to give them a complaint. I want to be the kind of man that's on my knees praying for other people. The only time I ever feel blessed with the Lord is when I'm being a blessing. When I want to be blessed, it's not working. I get blessed by blessing others. I get to serve Christ. It's an amazing thing. I get to love po folks in the power of the Spirit. It's wonderful. He's going to talk about looking in the mirror. We have to look at ourselves and take steps to change the person that's looking back at us. It's a personal letter. 
It asked me to put the word into practice. And it's not about me comparing myself to other believers. It's about me and the word of God. Do I really want to grow up? Do I really want to get honest? Because James is, is not going to play. His older brother didn't, and he's not going to. Verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, a slave of God, which makes him a slave of his brother, Jesus. Um, now, if you were God's brother, most of us have heard it said we would put Put a license plate, God's bro, have a chain on there, you know, James, Jesus, <laughs> shared a bunk bed with Jesus, you know, personalized license plate, a whole website, perhaps, uh, you know, James prefers slave. I'm a slave of my brother, Curios, uh, used by Hellenistic Jews for, for, for a name of God when he calls him a servant of God. The word he uses for Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is curios, which, 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 is, a, which is a Jewish term for God as well. Um, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, most likely written before the Gentiles became prominent at Antioch. To the Jewish believers scattered throughout the Roman Empire, greetings. Now many people like to dismiss it right away and say, well it ain't written to me, I ain't Jewish. It's written to all of us, you're wrong. It's written to all believers. We listen to this letter because it echoes what Jesus taught, the teaching of Jesus. This is important to Jesus. And it's given by a man who knows Jesus intimately. Verse 2. My brother, and count it all joy when you fall into di diverse temptations. I'm already not liking the letter. Um, ha be happy when various trials happen. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Matthew 5.11. Blessed are ye when men shall what? Revile you. Do you like that? No. I don't persecute you, shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad. You're in great company. They did it to the prophets. People re I rejoice when people speak good of me. When I leave on Sunday with my wife, I say, was it okay? Did I, you know, was it all right? And if it was good, we go out to eat. If it was bad, we just go home and eat leftovers. <laughs> I'm rejoicing when everybody's happy with me, not when they're mad at me or angry. And I, I do have something too to say to the church today. Pretty soon, folks are going to get real angry at us if we take the word of God seriously. <coughs> right now, we're in a real bad way. We're arguing over toilets. If a man or a woman, could, you know, a woman can go into a guy, it, it, it's, it's insanity. And you're on the wrong side if you want to stand that a male is a male and a female is a female. We're running into serious times in the churches. They're going to come and they're going to take away tax exempts. Pastors are going to have to go back to work. We're going to have to meet in houses. Things like this could possibly happen in our lifetimes. We see, we see the tide turning. We're going to have to be spiritually mature and be able to take a stand. People are going to revile us because we're going to take a stand on biblical marriage. We're going to show them a verse. They're going to say, I don't believe that. And we're going to have to stand on it. We're going to be reviled. And he says, count it all joy. They did it to the prophets. It says in Hebrews that the world was not worthy of the people who walked with the Lord. They ran around the world. They were sawn asunder. They were hated by everybody. They lived in caves. They had terrible lives. But the Bible says the world wasn't worthy of these people. Why? Because faith is believing in what you can't see. It's the substance of things hoped for. It's believing despite consequences in your life. A mature person will go all the way with his faith because he knows that what he's believed is going to be there when he gets there. Paul would say, you know, I've, I, I've settled it in my heart. I know that what I've believed, that he's faithful to complete it in all of our lives. And it's living our lives in such a way. You say, you, you say to yourself, you know what? This earth and the people that run this present world system, and all, none of that matters. Jesus said, don't fear the people that can kill the body. Fear him who can throw both body and soul into hell. There's a world of people out there that are on their way to hell is a real place. Why do I preach the gospel? Because I believe people are going to hell. And I don't want them to. Jesus doesn't want them to. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. <coughs> Rejoice when people revile you because the world hated Jesus, they're going to hate you as well. Count it a joy when you fall into these trials. Now fall, the word for fall is... Fall among thieves, basically, to encounter something or to come across something. Diverse is very colored and temptations is trials or literally experiment. So God's experiment me on, me, on us. I don't like the sound of that, right? No? Do you experiment on living creatures? No? Did you ever 
Did you ever chop chicken's head off, pluck it, and eat it? You didn't experiment with it first before and like slice it up a little bit, see how it hurts. Experiment, when, when, when it says experiment or a trial, I feel like I want to get through the difficulties of the trial. I just want to learn the lesson. In fact, I'd rather see somebody else go through the trial and learn a lesson through them than have to go through it myself. But it says not if we fall, it's when we fall into these various trials. So we're going to fall into them. Trials come from without and a temptation comes from within. Let me give you an example. Potiphar and Joseph. Joseph is, is Potiphar's wife. Joseph is taking care of all of Potiphar's things. She's beautiful. That was the, the trial. It was from without. The trial was the beautiful woman. Outside, the temptation came from inside. The lust of his flesh. Now think of him. Joseph went to jail for not sleeping with a woman who was coming on to him. He went to jail for not doing that. He lost his freedom for doing the right thing. He was in a foreign land. He was taking care of Potiphar. Everything Potiphar had, he made him rich. He didn't get anything for it. And the the woman sent everybody away, came. Nobody would know. Just be our thing. We can throw that skeleton bone in the closet door. It can be our thing. He says, no, God will know. God will know all about it. And I'd rather, I'm not going to hurt God. And he ran away. He went to jail for it. The temptation was within. It was real. There was a lust to it. He wanted to do it, but he resisted the temptation because he was mature. God allows our faith to be proved. Faith is tested by trials. Faith is not produced by trials. What is faith produced by? Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why we go through the word. Your pastor goes through the word of God week after week because faith comes by hearing that. How do I know I have faith? Well, when a trial comes, my faith is exposed. Do I have it or not? And when you see somebody going through a trial, you'll see how much faith they have by how they react to the trial that's coming their way. And we're all going to have trials because a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. You can't trust a faith that's never been tested. You can put a Ford truck on a commercial and tell me it can tow something up, but, but get stuck in the mud and see if it really works. You got to test it. You got to test it. Your faith is going to be tested so that you can find out if what you have is real. I'm glad for trials in my life because when I come out the other end, I realize that something I had, there's a realness to it. It's not theory anymore. It's actually played out in my life. You're going to go out into a real world. Some of you here might lose your wives. You might have difficulty at your jobs because of what you believe in. All these things, and you're going to have to believe after the testing and after all that comes through that Jesus in you make a majority. Everything else is, is, is meaningless. Your faith. Various trials are going to test your faith to see if there's a reality to it. So why is our faith tested? It reveals what we do have. Not to God, but to ourselves. Now why should we be joyful? Verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Anybody like patience? No. We've got to get everything right now. I want it right now. Faith works the patience in our lives. We know the trials and difficulties and temptation all create a patient endurance in us. I start to realize that, that, that this is earth. There's always going to be difficulties. There's always going to be trials. There's always going to be trouble. The second law of thermodynamics says things are going to run out. They're going to run down. We're going to die. My body's going to collapse one day. It's not going to work anymore. Trouble will come. And only children, only childish people, Christians believe that everything is going to be well all the time. Everything's going to be good. Everything's going to go well with them. One of the best lessons I learned as a kid was how to lose, right? If you don't learn how to lose, mature people, you know, they'll keep getting up. They'll try something. I'll give you an example. This is a guy that I, I work out with at the church. He's... He's a monster. He can do squat 405 pounds 20 times in a row, right? And the first time I worked out with him, he said, you're like a baby giraffe that's just been born. You can barely, you know, my legs are shaking. It was terrible. I kept coming back. I kept coming back. After a year, you know, I started to build. Now he's not embarrassed of me anymore. (laughs) Immature people say, I'm quitting. I'm quitting. And things get tough. 
Mature people keep getting up. Children quit. You know, it's Sam Bradford. I'll give you an example right there. You know, I'm not playing anymore. I'm not playing anymore. Some, there's some, somebody, somebody might be better than me, you know? <laughs> Trials mature us. They keep us patient and focused. Trials show us if we're mature. Now, if I'm grumbling and complaining, it shows that I'm childish. If I'm counting it a joy because I know it's working patience, then I'm mature. It's working patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect, complete, and entire, wanting nothing. If you're patient, you don't want anything. You already have everything. The Bible says we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have everything we need in Christ. How do Christians, this is, this is, how do Christians overseas today, the Syrian, you know, you see these videos of people getting their heads chopped off for Jesus. They have nothing in this world, but they have Jesus and they have everything. They have everything that they need. I don't just want to know about Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want Jesus to be that real to me that though everything is gone, like Job would say, Everything could be taken from me. Though he slay me, yet I'm going to keep serving him. That's a strong faith. And every time I look in the Bible, God is turned on by people with that strong faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. David, slaying a giant. All these things that I look in the Bible, those were the men that God really admires. And he calls out in scriptures the people that looked difficulty, danger, the terror of the world. We see where our world's headed and they stand up and they take a stand anyway despite the consequences on this earth. Realizing their treasure is there, not here in heaven. Working patience, hoopamony. The word is, is not passive. It's active endurance. It's bearing the weight. It's holding up. It's not just waiting at a doctor's office patiently. It's digging deep. It's finishing. It's like finishing a marathon. It's pushing. It's testing your endurance. One example of, a, of an adult is when you can delay gratification. You can, you can give in. Let others go first. Consider others. One verse has been going through my mind all the time is to esteem each other better than ourselves. One verse, really good. If we all did it, church would be wonderful. Saving instead of spending. You know, God is teaching us patience. Show me an impatient child and I'll show you a brat. Um, we have to let it work. Um, verse 4, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire that you want nothing. Patience has to have her perfect work. Let go and be patient. I don't know what you're going through today, but a lot of times in, in my life, it's just letting go and waiting on God. I found out that every time I take the horns to a situation, even as a pastor, or I try to jump in and offer my point of view, it ends horribly. When I stand back and I wait on the Lord, and if I can take the abuse long enough, he works it out always way better if I just let go. Let go, be patient. If you count it joy that God is working in your life, count it a joy that God is actually working in your life. If you don't have any trials, if you don't have any difficulties, if everything is good, then the Bible says we need to check ourselves and make sure that what we're believing in, because what you believe in, if you really believe in, think about what we believe in, okay? We believe that every political institution on this planet is corrupt. We believe that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords to the exclusion of every other religion. We believe every other religion is satanic to keep people away from Jesus from being saved. We go against the culture. We go against the morals of this world. We go against everything that this world stands for. We're living for another world. We want this world to be invaded by our God and taken over. This would kill the first century Christians. We believe in all those things and we believe in them passionately. So if you do believe in that stuff passionately, you're going to get some flack for it. And if you're getting flack for it, good, count it joy because God is working in your life. You're one of the few. If we know and understand in our heart that he's working in us patient, so we count it a joy that he's working in our lives and then we know that he's doing it to make us patient. And then we have to let him work. You've got to surrender. We'll want for nothing 
and will only be beholden to God. That's the maturity that I'm looking for in my life. Trials can grow us up or they can, they can show us up. They can show us up. I remember when we first started the fellowship, I called Jerry Paradise. I remember I was working 60 hours a week. I was driving from the Poconos all the way to East Orange and back again, doing a Wednesday night, doing a, a Friday night prayer, doing two services on a Sunday, and I'm losing my mind. I'm working 100 hours a week. My family doesn't even know who I am, and I'm angry all the time. And I said, Jerry, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm quitting. You know, I'm, I'm, I, you know I, can't, I can't do this. And Jerry said, as he always does. He's so peaced out. Anybody meet Jerry Paradise? He actually gets you mad because he just loves God so much. He's just like, man, I don't need some of that stuff that he's got. I'm high strung. And he's, pa- he's peaceful. He just said, Matt, you know, patience. Let it work. God will lead you and guide you. And I was so terrified of, of trusting the church with my family. I like to make my own money. I like to put my own money in the bank. I like to know I'm doing this. And God says, you're not trusting the church, you're trusting me. What do you want to do? You, don't, you, you can stay at your job, make a lot of money. I can work, work two jobs, I was doing great. Or you can trust me. It took me nine years of patiently waiting on God before I finally said, I give in, I want to serve you. And I let go of that because I can't let go of what the Lord's doing in my life. Patience. And it had its perfect work. It mellowed me down. It taught me how to wait on the Lord. It taught me that I I don't care about size. I care about faithfulness to God. I want to know the Lord in a deeper way. Let me give you an example of Jonah. Remember Jonah? God told him to preach. What did he say? No. I hate the Assyrians. I want them all dead. He hated them. In fact, his whole pleasure at the end was, was sitting on a hill waiting for the destruction to rain down on their city. So Jonah gets a whale of a trial, you know? Oh, it's for me. Throw me over the boat. And the, 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 the fish swallows him up. And you see him acting like a child and pouting outside the city, hoping God pours out his judgment. Jonah got weaned. He learned. He learned. God made him grow. And I pray it. As we finish up these verses, we finish up James. I know this, that if you take James to heart, and in my own life, I've been taking it to heart, that I grow. I've been growing more by doing than by theory. Theory's great. Knowing all about God is great. Knowing God's greater. Every good and precious gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. God can give you each everything that you need for every trial that you're going through. I look back at my life and you should look back at your life and there should be a testimony. There should be, man, there was a trial there that God got me out of drugs, alcohol, whatever it is. Maybe you had none of those problems. But maybe you're pompous. Maybe you're a religious person that thinks you know everything. Maybe you could be awesomely used by God, but you're too proud. And maybe you should just say, Lord, you know what? I've been patiently fighting with this for a long time. I've been fighting you on this. I want to let go today. I want to give my life to you. The power that is sitting in this room right now You guys are believers in Jesus Christ. You've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. What you have in you is a treasure that if you pass along out there, you could turn the world upside down. Twelve men did it in the first century. They had no education. They had nothing but Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, in their hearts and in their lives. And they were filled with a passion and a fire that is all that they lived for. And they were willing to die for it. If we take that fire and we listen to James and we be a doer of what God's already given us, each one of this, in this room is probably a genius if you've sat under John for a length of time or if you've listened to Joe or you've listened to these great guys, now is the time to take what we know, put it into lab work. Let God work. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I lift up these men to you. I ask, Lord, that by the power of your spirit, Lord, you'd fill each one of us. Lord, by the time I leave here today, Lord, I want to be more like you. Lord, I know in you dwells everything that I need. Lord, unless you build the house, we labor in vain. Lord, that you're not looking for the wise or the noble. Not many of them are called, but Lord, you've chosen the weak things, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. I look at your brother, Lord, and and I'm grateful, Lord, that he jotted this letter down, Lord, to show me in my life, Lord, that I need to grow up. Lord, I want to be more like you. And I know to do that, Lord, I got to be willing 
Lord, to die to myself. So, Father, I ask, Lord, that by the power of your Spirit, Lord, fill me, make me a man after your very heart. Help me not to kick against the goads, Lord. Help me to yield every time you speak to my heart. I pray for these men here today. I pray that after we eat and after we go through more of your word, Lord, that by the time we leave here, we would truly be loving you more than when we came in. In your name, amen.